Uh, our next interview is with Jim Pressgreaves, uh, a bookseller, uh, started his first catalog in 1973. And Jim, give us a little bit about your background, your family, schools, where you grew up, uh, etc. <clears throat> okay, uh, born in an area between Richmond and Fredericksburg. My family was a victim of the second federal invasion of Virginia when the uh, army came in and bought land for Fort A.P. Hill, military reservation, and everybody had to move out. We were dispersed, uh, lived in about three or four places, and, and then ended up, I ended up in Richmond, uh, went to the University of Richmond and taught in Richmond for seven years, and then took a position with the uh, Virginia Community College and uh, w located at Withville, there were branches, <clears throat> and uh, moved out there in 1967. Uh, 1973, we moved to a little town called Rural Retreat, which had a house that was the size that I needed for my family, and built a bookstore there also, and uh, been in that location ever since. What part of Virginia? Uh, is it Very much southwest Virginia. You draw a straight line between Toronto and Atlanta, and you'd go through with, well, we call it the uh, Appalachian area. The Appalachian area. You, uh, did you have, uh, what did your parents do? Uh, mother was a school teacher. My father uh, had a variety of jobs, uh, farming. Uh, later, he worked uh, in a stone quarry. And sub subsequently, he was a security guard for George Mason University. Mm -hmm. Do you have any siblings? Uh, I have one brother who's deceased about five years ago, younger. Okay. When, when essentially, were you bitten by the book bug? Say again. When were you bitten by the book bug? <laughs> <clears throat> Easy. Uh, about age 12. <laughs> went to an auction sale, and uh, uh, I had 15 cents in my pocket. And uh, they put up a uh, device that you put on top of a kerosene stove. Uh, they call them camp ovens. <clears throat> but there was a book stuck in it. So uh, I thought, okay. So I bid my dime. This other la our lady over here bid 15 cents, and that was it. I couldn't go to 20 so I thought maybe I could salvage something, and I did salvage something. I said, ma'am, did you buy it for the oven or for the book? Well, she says, I can't read and write, so you might as well take the book. <laughs> <coughs> Carried it home. My grandfather recognized it as a very important piece of local history. It would be called a uh, Civil War regimental today. And he helped me sell it for $25. Wow. Now, this was about 1950. And that $25 then would be the equivalent to probably 250 maybe 500 today. <clears throat> but anyhow, uh, my aunt says I never looked back, and my uh, colleagues tell me I've tried to maintain the same profit ratio. <laughs> and so I knew then that books could be valuable, and uh, uh, I didn't really try to sell anything until after I moved out to Withville and then began a catalog uh, operation. And you've been there ever since? Uh, in With County, yes. In, in, First in Withville and, and then, then moved out. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about the kinds of books that you specialize in, if you specialize. You're more of a <coughs> generalist, aren't you? I'm very much of a generalist. You can specialize yourself to death. Yeah, that's true. And uh, after you specialize, then you specialize a little more. After a while, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've had uh, uh, a good general uh, inventory and have sold a wide variety of material. And uh, what's your, been your experience with the Internet, if any? Okay, I'm represented on about four or five different uh, online book lines. Uh, my experience with the Internet is that any fool can put any book on at any price. And uh, unfortunately, we have to contend with Miss Smith, who buys the book at 
a yard sale for 50 cents and she can price it at three dollars and have a higher percentage of profit than I could if I paid 10 for it and tried to sell it for 25. Right. And then her first cousin, of course, is Mr. P.O.D., print on demand. <coughs> Very sad story. <coughs> I won't say from what source, but I ended up with 25 box, banker boxes of 19th century, good, solid, religious material. And uh, out of any box, 25 at least 15 of them were P.O.D.'d. Really? Now, we're talking about print-on-demand. We're not talking about some bodily function that somebody has practiced on those. <laughs> but uh, so, so you, you've had your experience with the Kessingers and, and the Naboos of this world who oh, yes. who've yeah. just yeah. print anything that they can get their hands on. Yeah. Has, how, has that affected your business in any way? Of course, of course. It means <coughs> that... Uh, I before I price a book, I will check it on the internet, and when I do, uh, I try to get competitive. <clears throat> now I don't intend to get down and grovel with Kessinger or with POD, as the case may be, but I do try to keep it where I make it as attractive as possible. And I don't mind selling against those boys because some of them will have <clears throat> uh, a POD copy for thirty-seven. Uh, 50, and I'll put in my catalog. Uh, you can buy a POD copy for 37.50. My price, twenty-eight dollars. Has it worked out for you? I've never done an analysis of it. It's more a case of uh, uh, maintaining my own ego. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are some of the? Who are some of the people? Who were an influence on you when you were just starting out in the trade and, and you were trying to, to be a bookseller? <clears throat> yeah. Probably the individual who made the greatest impression was named Reed Fulton. <clears throat> he was uh, a lecturer and I think he never got promoted beyond that to, uh, seemed to me, two colleges in New York City, <clears throat> one daytime and one nighttime. That's how he made a little extra money. And I swear and declare that he must have had a minimum bid place with uh, Swan because <clears throat> he used to have boxes and boxes shipped in like that. Uh, but uh, he was famous for three things. One of them was that he would use a pencil and scroll the biggest numbers you ever saw on the front, heavily in, uh, scribed so that you couldn't erase it and take it out. <laughs> and, but you could spot the books easily. <clears throat> uh, the second thing he was responsible for as far as, and I didn't learn that one, but he always said, when you go to a bookshop, first place you look is the top shelf and the bottom shelf because most people are too lazy to look there. <clears throat> and the third is, yeah, you can specialize yourself to death. Uh, <clears throat> he was very much of an individualist. Uh, he had a tract of timber and he was uh, uh, offered a certain price for it and he said, well, can't you do any better than that? They said, well, if we don't have to clean up the laps. Now, if you're rural deprived, you need to know laps refers to the limbs that you trim off of the logs. <clears throat> uh -huh. And a good lumberman will always clean up his laps. But uh, this guy, Bynes, told uh, Fulton that he could uh, pay him more if he didn't have to clean up the laps. Fulton said, let him stay there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was Fulton. Uh, another individual from whom I learned a great deal was named F.M. Hill. Uh, he was 20 years older than I. <clears throat> I don't know that I could identify any one specific thing from him uh, so much as the fact that he was always somebody I could go and talk to and uh, we would talk back and forth. We had a transaction that, or uh, the understanding that whoever passed first, the other one would uh, be responsible for helping the family disperse. Well, the rascal died first. 
Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, about four years ago, yeah. and I've been helping to uh, handle some of that, hoping that somebody would be as ethical in my situation as I have tried to be in his. I, I liked him a lot. He was, he was a good bookman. Yeah, yeah. Good bookman. Now, a third person whose name I will not call, but <clears throat> he was talking about reference books. He said, I never bought a reference book that didn't pay for itself. And I want to tell you that I've had some that I'm still waiting for them to pay for themselves. <laughs> but they, uh, <clears throat> one time, <clears throat> there was a domestic who would leave new domestic, but each evening when she left, she had a shopping bag, and the owners couldn't figure out why she was uh, taking the shopping bag home. So finally they said to her, we need to check your shopping bag. We're not going to... Uh, uh, call the police or anything, but we've checked the silver, you're not taking silver, check the china, you're not taking the china, check the linen, you're not checking the linen. What's in the shopping bag? She took it out as grapefruit rinds, choo, 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 like that. And they said, why are you taking those grapefruit rinds home? Lord God, it makes my garbage look so stylish. <laughs> <coughs> and reference books make my descriptions look stylish. Well, there's the, there's the connection right there, Jim. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things have changed in the book trade since the internet. Yeah. Um, what what kind what have you noticed more than anything else, perhaps, uh, as being a direct uh, detriment or benefit because of the internet? Okay, <clears throat> let's go positive first. I sell books in places I would never be able physically to go. <clears throat> Occasionally, I buy books. Uh, it's particularly good if you've got a single volume, you're looking for the odd volume. <clears throat> Make your sets. Uh, once in a while, uh, uh, a customer will come in, can you find a certain book? But we don't do a whole lot of that because it's not really uh, uh, profit productive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it's only for $25, I'd feel bad if I charge the customer 35 Yeah. Uh, because a lot of the people who put it on don't have a first idea about professional discounts. So anyhow, but that's one of the positives. You can find things, you can sell things away, and so forth. As I said earlier, the uh, uh, competition from the uninformed. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, another positive. You will find sometimes... This one will give a certain pagination, and he's missed it. And this one will uh, sometimes call it a first when it's not a first. And then uh, occasionally you'll find that there's a mess up on the number of plates in a book, and so forth. So uh, that gives you something you can sell against. Yeah. <clears throat> so those, those are positives. The negative, pew, price. Yeah, the price. That race to the bottom. <laughs> okay, nicely put. Yeah, race to the bottom. Uh, I've always I've always maintained the the three rules for for selling on the internet. You either have the only copy, the cheapest copy, or the best copy. And Excellent. If you, if you remember those three rules, you'll be okay. Unfortunately, I don't remember them. <laughs> I just keep on going the way I'm going. <laughs> Well, I love to put a line on there. No other copy online. <laughs> but that, that gives you a, a little heads up anyhow. Yeah. Um, if, if you were a young bookseller and getting into the trade today, uh, would you become a bookseller? And if you would, how would you do it? First off, I couldn't conscientiously encourage anybody to do it. I think you're looking at one of the... Uh, uh, first steps in dinosaurhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 50 years from now, the only people who are going to be selling books are going to be Salvation Army. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> now, there's always going to be a demand for great books. Yeah. But <clears throat> you're not going to find over uh, of the people that are, quote, selling books today. A, look at the average age of people exhibiting. B, uh, they're not... You can't identify 
20 members who were under age 40. Where is next year's crop coming from? You don't know. It's certainly a crap shoot, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> so no, conscientiously, I couldn't advise somebody to do that. Um, <clears throat> Now, if they're foolish enough to go against it, then I'd tell them, keep selling to me until they... Until <laughs> <laughs> they have no more. <laughs> yeah. What do you think are some of the big challenges facing booksellers in the decades to come? I'm reminded of a story they told about a dealer that I met the first year that I was did the Boston show back in the late seventies. <clears throat> I didn't know that this was true and I don't know that it's true today. That's why I'm not gonna call a name, but supposedly he won a million dollars in the lottery, gonna pay him fifty thousand dollars a year for the next twenty years. And they interviewed him, said, Well sir, said, what are you gonna do? He says, Well I guess I'll just keep selling books until it's all gone. <laughs> until it's all gone. <laughs> the eternal optimist, huh? <laughs> yeah, so challenges. Uh, I think you've got to get out and dig for new customers. You cannot count on the status quo for two reasons. One, they're getting choked. And two, uh, you may have saturated them with the kinds of materials that you run into. Uh, just as a far out example, uh, let's suppose it's uh, books on surveying. A, how many schools are there on surveying? And uh, B, what is their budget? And C, how well have you already saturated their needs? <coughs> so you better start looking in Canada for surveying schools. You better look in Australia for surveying schools. And as I say, that's a far out example, but I think it gives you a point. Mm -hmm. You gotta do your own digging. Yeah, I, I think that's that's probably the best way to put it. Um, when you uh, started in the book business, the whole thing was different than it was now, or than it is now. We had bookstores all over the place where you could go and buy things, mm -hmm. and, and they're disappearing and disappearing. Do you uh, are you one of those people who feel that at some point there won't be any more bookshops out there? I think there'll be a lot fewer. I can't tell you where there'll be none. Uh, <clears throat> I read from place to place, you know, street that had ten bookshops, now it's got two, and you wonder how long those two can hang on, which one will be the first to fall off. Yeah. So I can't speculate intelligently on that mm -hmm. one. Uh, what percentage of your business do you do at book fairs? Okay, I have been doing <clears throat> two types of fairs, antique shows and book fairs. Uh, antique shows have just gone shwoosh, so I don't really do those anymore. <clears throat> uh, book fairs, I get enough activity to justify about, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. Probably not more than 10 a year. Now, dollar-wise, I've never really uh, done a computation yeah, of that, uh, sell, we sell books uh, by catalog, by the internet, in antique malls, and in uh, book fairs. <clears throat> but I probably ought to go home and do that, so that's a good question. To, uh, well, something to, to think about anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. See what percentage of your business comes from what, so you can maybe want to yeah. intensify or decrease yeah. depending upon what it is. You yeah. just don't know. Um, You've been doing this for how long now? Since seventy. First catalog came out in nineteen seventy-three. Yeah, but you were you were involved in books before that. Oh yeah, yeah. And you've been involved uh, with them heavily ever since. What kind of a staff do you maintain? <clears throat> right now, 
I would say that there are five people that get checks from us each month, depending on whether it's for uh, domestic uh, care, <clears throat> whether it's a teenager that helps with loading and unloading <clears throat> and lifting and toting, <clears throat> uh, a lady with major uh, locomotion challenges, but she's able to uh, do database entry for catalog purposes. And then one lady has been with me for beyond 30 years, and one has been there 12 years. And that, that's, your, that's your staff. Yep. And you, you hope to maintain that staff and, and maintain your shop. Well, as I told you, I guess I'll just keep doing it until it's all mm -hmm. gone. Until it's all gone. Okay. Jim, do you have any words of wisdom for young booksellers before we say bye-bye? <coughs> yes, I said <coughs> earlier, you look for avenues. An avenue that I never thought I'd ever be involved in is uh, disposal of low-end books through a booth in an antique mall. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I first got involved in that probably 20, 25 years ago. <clears throat> and so if I put a book in a catalog once and then I'd wait three or four years, it would go in a catalog twice and it didn't sell. So the idea was to take what didn't sell down to the mall. Mm. Okay, that's a great idea. But guess what? The next time in somebody's house, here's a nice set of jazzy stuff and dust stackets. You wouldn't have them on your shelf, Mike, but the point is that they look like they ought to sell, yeah. and I can buy them inexpensively. So I put three ninety five, four ninety five on each one and put them in there. What am I doing? I'm buying to fill stuff on the mall that's supposed to be the disposal unit for the stuff that didn't sell out of the catalogs. Right. Cross purposes. Yeah. So what I would say to young booksellers is do, don't overlook the <clears throat> ways that you can sell, of which that's one. Another is uh, to, uh, uh, as I say, fo focus on the models. How much time we got left? A couple of minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Probably cut my nose off in spite of my face, but I will talk about the importance of cultivating friends of the library groups. That's a good point. And you go to <clears throat> uh, somebody there and uh, you make a uh, pitch that you will do a two-hour uh, program. First hour will be on collecting old books and you talk about mistakes, you talk about uh, edition, condition, and so forth. And the second hour is that you do uh, uh, appraisals. Now, <clears throat> depending on how much you like the library, how much they have bought from you, the community, uh, you let them charge five bucks a whack, and uh, you may or may not be able to get them to split it, uh, may get them to be able to cover your mileage, whatever, or overnight as the case may be. But the point is that uh, it gives you an avenue that you wouldn't normally reach. And, uh, yeah. I, I think that that's, if I was creating a legacy, I would give that to beginners or other people. Creating, you're creating customers and you're creating a, a situation where people appreciate the fact that there are books in this world. Yeah, and I do insist that <clears throat> each person, uh, okay, they limit them to three and then they have to come back and get in line again. And so <clears throat> they get three tickets. Now, they come up, I take the tickets, but I hate to take a ticket for a book that's not worth a hang. Yeah, yeah. So he gets a ticket back, he goes back and gets his five bucks back. Right, or brings him another book, brings yeah. some more books in. That's right. It, sound, it sounds like an interesting thing, and yeah. hopefully it will work for some young booksellers, but who knows what the world's going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. We just don't know. Jim, we've reached the end of the time. Thanks so much for your time and energy. I appreciate your humor as well. <laughs>